All right, we're now recording, so let's get started. If there are no questions or anything so far, um, let's just do a quick, uh, I don't do anything very quickly, uh, review of what's going to happen. This is it, the day you've been dreading all term, the last day of class. So what we'll be doing is wrapping up as much as we can 4.4, um, and we have just a little bit left on that. We skipped 4.5 because if you remember, 4.5 was the alternative to doing 4.4. We went with 4.4. So we'll skip 4.5 and go into 4.6. Now I doubt if we're going to get super far in 4.6, and it doesn't matter. I have some questions from that on the test, but if we don't get far enough for you to do them, they'll just be bonus, okay? Uh, they're embedded. They're also part of the same things that we're doing now. So uh, we'll talk about the test. So stop me maybe five minutes early uh, because if I'm not mistaken, I saw the test because I, I loaded it on, U on um, Blackboard message this morning and because it was on my toolbar, I guess, or, or act, still active and open, it got pulled up and I might be able to show it to you on the uh, screen. So stop me about five minutes early uh, if I get rambling on too much and I'll we'll go over what is required on the final exam then. Okay, um, now you ask about uh, research paper, please get that in as soon as you possibly can because um, I have been printing stuff almost nonstop since I got back from the weekend and I had some left over from the weekend but a fairly small stack this much I've printed since the weekend just about uh, had a small stack left over from the weekend uh, but it wasn't that big so I'm going to be grading like crazy for the next several days and then once I get them graded I'll put things on blackboard so blackboard's behind everything's behind because I've gotten such a slug of papers here right at the end so uh, as soon as I'm through with these two classes today, I've got one advising session this afternoon, but other than that, I'll be grading, 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 grading. Now, I'm sure I'll still be getting more papers in because I've been giving finals and stuff like this. So other people have still got things they need to turn in, so they'll be turning those in, and uh, so it's just going to be a rush job for the rest of the weekend, uh, trying to get everything graded, grades in Blackboard, Average is done, grades determined, and then Monday morning, in fact, Monday at noon, I have to have the grades in. That's the deadline for me to put grades in. So that means please get me this last test, and if there are any other tests, I can't remember if you have any others you haven't turned in yet or not. Uh, I'm not just talking to you, Billy. I'm talking to anyone who's listening to it on YouTube video. Uh, please, please get me your things as soon as you finish them. Don't wait and say, well, I'll send them all at once. No, get them to me as soon as you finish. And that way, if I do have a few moments or something like that, I can print them and grade them and not wait until the very end and have three or four paper things to grade at the very end because there's going to be enough of that with my other classes. Um, so uh, bottom line of that is get me what you finish as you finish it. Uh, you can either send it to me by email or send it to me through Blackboard message. Either way, get it to me uh, as soon as you can. Now, once I give you, and it's already out there, the, the last test, that means you have, <laughs> unfortunately, a very short window to get that done. Uh, if you can get it to me this afternoon, that would be wonderful. Now, that's pushing it. I'm not really anticipating many of those, but if you can, that would be absolutely wonderful. Anytime tomorrow would be great. Anytime Saturday will be okay, okay? But please, if, you're going, if it's going to come in Sunday, make it early enough in the day I can get it graded before coming in 10 o'clock Sunday night is just as bad as Monday morning because I'm not going to be printing very many things after 10 o'clock Sunday night. So please get it to me, if possible, by midday, the latest mid-afternoon on, on Sunday. 
the earlier if possible as much as you can as soon as you can and that way I will have a better chance of getting things graded so I can get the grades on blackboard if I don't get them in time to do the grading it'll be an incomplete until I get the grading done and then I'll change the incomplete to a grade okay all right any questions on that and like I say stop me about five minutes before the end of the class today and we'll go over that final exam it's just test four chapter four test all right um, we were doing last time I don't think you were here but I can't remember for sure yeah I don't think you were here we were doing example eight okay we're in chapter four higher order differential equations section 4.4 undetermined coefficients a superposition approach now just a little bit of review of where that's coming from 4.3 we talked about higher order differential equation now we're okay time out again we're talking about linear differential equations okay uh, higher order linear differential equations 4.3 were homogeneous linear higher order differential equations that meant that whatever you had with all the uh, y's and y primes and y double primes and as many derivatives of y as you wanted was on one side of the equation and then the uh, on the right hand side was zero that's homogeneous now not just that we also are requiring that all those y's y primes y double prime all the derivatives of y their coefficients are constants not variable we did linear equations earlier with them variable coefficients especially first order now we're doing higher order with constant coefficients okay that was 4.3 when it was homogeneous 4.4 is then what to do when they're non-homogeneous and in this case example 8 you see on the left hand side is a second order so it's a higher order differential equation linear differential equation with constant coefficients happen to be 1 and 1 okay now on the right hand side you have something that is not okay not a uh, uh, zero it is a function function of x okay can't have any y's over here and for constant coefficients can't have any x's over here okay so they're course segregated here so um, what we've done in this pro and this is also an initial value problem since it's a second order differential equation you need two initial conditions remember initial conditions are always at the same value of your dependent independent variable x in this case pi x is pi and your y is zero at pi and your first derivative of y is two at pi okay so there's your initial condition all right now they didn't show you how but we did it in class so you can go back and watch youtube video you first solve what they call the complementary equation that's the homogeneous part okay the y double prime plus y is equal to zero. So just ignore this for now set it equal to zero you do that since you have constant coefficients by your auxiliary equation becomes that m squared your assumption here is y is equal to e to the mx that's always the assumption when you have constant coefficients of a linear higher order differential equation that's the assumption so with that in place if you go through the math of it you'll find out you get down to the auxiliary equation which is just the algebraic equation m squared plus uh, one is equal to zero okay and uh, that's your uh, auxiliary equation well of course m squared plus one is equal to zero is going to give you m is equal plus or minus i okay and then if you go back to 4.3 and when you have that as one of your conditions that was there case three uh, then that comes out to be an e to the alpha x but since the alpha here was zero that doesn't enter the picture here 
times C1, there's your first arbitrary coefficient, cosine beta x, the beta was 1, okay, so cosine x plus C2 sine x, beta x, which is 1. So there's your complementary solution for the homogeneous part. Now, the g of x over here on the right-hand side is a combination of a, a, a sum of a linear function, polynomial function, and a um, trig function, okay, sine or cosine. Those are the only ones allowed, okay, because they have to be continuous and have continuous derivatives. So it's the sum of a linear polynomial and a sine function. So your particular solution, we assume for the linear part, is going to be ax plus b. Okay, and there we have the first part. For the um, sine function, your assumption is um, and use different, and these are the coefficients that you're undetermined. And the book doesn't like to use d, so they start with c times cosine x plus d times sine x. Okay, e, I'm sorry, e times sine x. But here we have a problem okay because your this part of your particular solution duplicates part of your complementary solution okay uh, so what you have to do then rather than that particular solution sort of like we did in case two of the homogeneous case when something conflicts there put an x in so you put in x c x cosine x plus e x sine x now these don't duplicate the sine x here okay or the yeah or the cosine x there i'm sorry there, it was both of them now that is now your particular solution the sum because this was a sum here the sum of those two possibilities okay now what you do now is take the first derivative of that y particular solution and then you take the second derivative of the particular solution we did all that last time okay and then you plug those in here to your first second derivative here there's no first derivative but you have to take it to get the second derivative and then the y function the particular solution there so plug those in here and that gives you uh, and they've rearranged the order here um, the, the yp part is a x plus b minus um, they've skipped so many steps you can't see this but if you go back and watch the video you'll see we did all the steps in here your bottom line comes out to be this then okay and this thing here has to equal the right-hand side. Okay, so what you see right off the top, B has to be zero. Because there is no constant term here, uh, so B is zero. Okay, now, the linear terms. You have AX here, a 4X here, so A has to be 4. Got that. Um e has to be zero because there's no cosine x over here so e has to be zero there it is e is equal to zero and your minus 2c here must equal 10 so c must be negative 5 and there that is so now you plug that in your general solution is your complementary solution that has undetermined I'm, I'm sorry arbitrary coefficients those are your required coefficients c1 here, okay there it is c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x that's the complementary solution plus this um, particular solution we came up with with those constants in there um, 4x minus 5 
sine x, the 5x sine x, because you plug it into this one. Okay, so there is our solution. That's where we wrapped up last time. We got our general solution with the arbitrary con uh, coefficients in it. The problem is, this is a initial value problem, so we now have to determine what those no longer arbitrary, those coefficients here, C1 and C2 are. So I will take us to the whiteboard, get my Wacom in place here, and now I've got some more housekeeping to do here. Um, there's a taskbar you can't see, or toolbar, whatever you want to call it, down here that's in my way, so I had to move it. And then I'm going to take the whiteboard and scoot it as far to the left and as far up as I can to give me maximum space. Okay. Now I think for the whiteboard purposes, I'm going to move you and me over here to the side. That'll give me a little more room to work on the whiteboard. So let me scoot this a little further up and over. Okay. Enough of that. So here's where we left off before, if I use the right end of the pen. Okay, here we go. What we had was your general solution, y, is equal to c1 cosine x <coughs> excuse me, plus c2 sine x I have to write slowly, else the pen does all sorts of weird things. And then those are from the complementary solution, the arbitrary coefficients, and then with the coefficients we have now determined for the particular ones, that's a plus 4x minus 5x cosine x. Okay, now, all right, now our initial conditions, this is all subject to y at pi has to be equal to zero and y prime at pi has to be equal to 2. Now, one disadvantage of working from this board is the fact that I've lost my first derivative. So we're going to have to go back and take the first derivative again, but that's not too hard to do. Um, so let's do that first because we're going to need it for the second initial condition. So y prime, the general solution, first derivative of that will be a minus C1 sine x, because the derivative of cosine is minus sine, plus C2 cosine x, because the derivative of sine is cosine, plus 4 minus 5, wait, huh? I left off my x some reason I was already, wait, no, 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 I'm taking the derivative, sorry about that, I thought I was right, I forgot what I was doing there, this is such a pain in the neck, this, I can't believe, okay, goodness gracious, this Wacom has some strange character, okay, here we have a product, we're taking a derivative of it. So we're going to use our product rule. 
I don't know how you like to do it, but usually it's the first times the derivative of the second. So that's going to be x times the derivative of a cosine is minus sine. So this one's going to change to plus sine x. And then that minus you still have there. So let's put it back. Minus 5 times the derivative of the first times the second. Well, the derivative of x is just 1 and the second is just cosine x. Okay, so there's your first derivative. Now we can plug our initial conditions in here. Okay, so y at pi, nice and rhymey, isn't it, is equal to plug in pi for x. What's the cosine of pi? negative 1. Good. Okay. So you're in a what area? Okay. I'll, I'll give you more time to respond then. I have some classes no one wants to say a word. I appreciate you trying to respond. I'll shut up. Alright. Plus if I can get the pen to come back Come on, pen. There you are. Okay. Now, what happens when we plug in a pi for sine? Sine of pi is? No, no. It's, it's zero. Okay. So this term completely disappears. And when the next term is just a plus 4 pi. When you plug in pi for x, you get plus 4 pi. And the next term gives you a minus, okay, except what's cosine of pi going to be? No, minus 1, just like it was before. Okay, so that's going to change that to a plus 5 pi. Right? Okay. So you wind up and this has to equal zero because your first initial condition is equal to zero. Well, this tells you that minus C1 plus 9 pi is zero, meaning that C1 is 9 pi. Right? Okay. So let's go to the second condition, y prime, also at pi, this is what makes it an initial condition, is equal to, and we already know what c1 is, 9 pi. So that's a minus, well wait a minute, let's not get too carried away. What is sine of pi? No, cosine is negative 1. Sine of pi is? Remember, pi start, uh, sine starts at 0, goes up to 1 at pi halves, and then back down to 0 at pi. So that's pi. So this isn't going to give you anything, okay? Sorry I wrote the minus sign there, okay? Let's see. I think I can do this. I'm going to try this. There we go. Uh, I erase that way. All right, let's plug in the second one, C2 times the cosine of pi. Well, that's going to produce this cosine of pi is negative 1 again. So that's minus C2 plus 4 wait, uh, yeah, plus 4 plus, well, wait a minute, what is sine of pi again? zero so this term completely goes away okay so now we have and this is equal to two from your second initial condition well let's move the c2 to that side and subtract for two from this side and you get c2 is equal to two if i did it right 
Now we go back to our general solution and fill in these coefficients. Okay, y is equal to c1 was 9 pi times the cosine x plus 2 sine x. It's a rather strange problem. <clears throat> plus 4x minus 5x cosine x. Okay, that should be our solution of the initial value problem, and I've got it, well, whoops, no, wrong place. Okay, there we have. Um, y is equal to 9 pi cosine x plus 7. How did I do that? Okay. I think I left off my pie. It's five, didn't I? <laughs> um, I think I was looking at the wrong place. Let's go back and do this y prime at pi. That gave us a zero. This gave us a minus c2. That gave us a four. This gave us a zero. I forgot that last term out there. I just left it hanging there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to have to use there. Okay. I'm glad I left a little room there anyway. I forgot this term here. Okay. Minus 5 times cosine of minus 1. Uh, cosine of pi is minus 1, so that's going to be a plus 5. Okay. Now, Let's also undo this, and that will be also undoing this. Okay, I believe that's right. Now, all right, what we have here is that C2 would then equal 9 minus 2, which is 7, and that's where you put your 7 in here, plus 7 sine x plus 4x minus 5x cosine x. Now let's check and see how the book did. 9 pi cosine x plus 7 sine x plus 4x minus 5x cosine x. He finally got it right. All right, so there is our worked out example 8. We got it so close but didn't quite get to finish it last time. All right. So let's go back to the book. Any questions on this before we leave it? Okay. Let's go back to the text, which is here. And now, Billy, you're in the way again, so let's move you up here. Okay. Now, that was example eight. Come down here. This is where we began this time. We did the well, we started plugging in and got the C1 equal to 9 pi. Plug that in to your Y prime, and that gave you your C2 equals 7 when you use all the terms. And that then gives you your answer. 9 pi cosine X plus 7 sine X plus 4x minus 5x cosine x. All right, going to start example 9 in just a moment, but evidently it's warming up to be a pretty warm day today. Already the room's getting warm. Let me turn on my ceiling fan. Okay, sorry about that. It was very pleasant in here first thing. Not quite anymore. Okay, so let's scoot on down here and see example 9. We did one with addition. Now we're going to do one with multiplication. Here's your linear 
uh, higher order linear um, differential equation with constant coefficients 1, minus 6, and 9. And then over here you have a polynomial 6x squared plus 2 and then add to that a exponential function. And I'm trying to see why they say the multiplication rule because this is an addition again just like the last one was. Okay. Now what we do in this one and they skip right on and just tell you what it is. We'll go back and do it. Let's do the characteristic solution. All right. I never think you get too much practice doing this. Okay. So I'm going to clear the screen if I can find it. Right there it was. There we go. Now, let me get the book in front of me. It's easy to write. Now that I can't see that. Okay, here we have y double prime, higher order. See, I have to write slowly or the pen skips. Minus 6y prime, or it gets really jerky, plus 9y is equal to 6x squared plus 2 minus 12e to the 3x. Okay. Now, not an initial value problem, a general, so we don't worry with initial conditions on this one. That means the answer will have arbitrary coefficients. How many? Two, because it's a second order differential equation. Okay, let's start with the left hand side. Pretend that the right hand side is zero and we'll come up with our <coughs> uh, characteristic solution. Well, to do that, when you pretend that's equal to zero, your assumption is y is equal to e to the mx. You plug that in, you take the first root of that and the second root of this, go through all that work, you get the auxiliary equation, which is simply m squared minus 6m plus 9 is equal to zero, because you assume the right-hand side is zero. Okay, well that's a... Um, fairly simple quadratic equation to deal with and what you get is m is equal to because this is m minus 3 times m minus 3 so it's a repeated root of m is equal to 3 okay but it's a repeated root now that was our case 2 back in 4.3 and what you do with that is your y complementary now is equal to c1 e to the 3x. Remember the assumption was y is equal to e to the mx 3x plus c2. You can't just use the 3x again even though both m's were 3 so this is where you put your extra x in there e to the 3x. Those are now linearly independent uh, solutions and they work. Okay. Now how about the particular solution? Come over here and what would be your estimated form here? Y sub p yuck. Y sub p well here's the quadratic part. Now you have to account for every term in a quadratic even though this is missing a linear term. So we'll start with a x squared plus b x plus c. Okay. Now for this part here, so this is going to be a plus. Normally you would say e. They don't like to use d. E 
times e to the 3x. You can't use that because they already have one here. So you put an x in there. E x e to the 3x. But you can't use that because you got that one here already. So this time it's going to be plus e x squared e to the 3x. All right, that's going to be our particular solution. Let's make sure they have it right here. First, the complementary solution, c1 e to the 3x plus c2 x e to the 3x. Got it. And then particular solution, ax squared plus bx plus c plus e x squared e to the 3x. Perfect. Now, what you have to do with that is take your derivatives so you can plug the particular solution in here and then set it equal to that. So here we go with our derivatives. y sub p prime. You want to do them or you want me to do them? Okay, 2ax, right? Derivative of ax squared would be 2ax plus b. This term gives you nothing. Derivative of a constant is 0. Plus, here we have a product rule. Maybe that's why they call this uh, a multiplication rule. I don't know, okay? I don't think so because the other one had that too. So it's going to be e, and then usually we do uh, first times derivative of the second. The derivative of the second is going to give you a 3 in front of that e. 3x squared, the first is x squared, and then e to the 3x. That 3 came from the chain rule here. Okay, but then the second part of your product rule is going to be your e. times the derivative of the first, which is going to be a 2x. So you'll need a 2 there, an x there, and then an e to the 3x. So there's your first derivative, okay, of the particular solution. Let's do the second derivative of your particular solution. And that would be 2a. That gives you nothing plus now we have another product rule and I'm going to leave a blank for the coefficient okay and put our e in there that's part of the coefficient first times the root of the second the root of the second will produce another three so three times three would be nine e x squared because it's just first times the root of the second e to the three x write too fast the pen does it write well okay second part of this one okay lots of parts here uh, second part is going to be derivative of the first times the second that's going to produce a 2 and 2 times 3 is going to be 6 so it's going to be 6 e derivative of x squared is 2 x I already took care of the 2 x e to the 3 x Okay, now let's go to this term. Plus, you're not going to have another E in there. That's going to be for sure. Capital E and little e. And it'll be first times the root of the second. That's going to produce another 3. So 2 times 3 will be 6 for this one. And the first is x. And the root of this is e to the 3x. And then, I don't know if I'm going to have room, so let me come down here. The second will be um, the derivative of the first times the second. Well, the derivative of x is just 1. So then the 2 doesn't have anything multiplied by it, so it's just going to be 2 e e to the 3x. I don't know why that 3 will not write well. 
there is our second derivative. Now, if you see I'm making an error, please stop me and, and show me or tell me or we'll correct it. All right, <laughs> so now what we've got to do is write all this mess down here in our original differential equation. So first we've got to write our y double prime. Okay, now let's start by being a little bit smarter about it. There's only one term with a in it, and that's just 2a. So we'll write that down if I can get the pen to show up here. There it is. So 2a. Now, here is the one and only term with the x squared e. So that we'll just write that one down. Plus 9e x squared e to the 3x. Okay. Now, here we have 6EX e to the 3X and another 6EX to the 3X. That makes 12 of them. So that'll be plus 12EX times E to the 3X. And then you just have that 1 plus 2E e to the 3x. It's going to be here a while, aren't we? All right, next thing we've got is, where's my pen? There it is. Minus 6 times this y p prime. So we got to multiply minus 6 by it. So here we go. Minus 6 times 2 will be a minus 12 a x minus 6 times b would be minus 6b that's easy enough next one minus 6 times 3 would be a minus 18 e capital e x squared e to the 3x and then a minus 6 times 2, which will be a minus 12, e x, e to the 3x. That's just the first two terms. The next term is going to be plus 9 times your yp. So that's going to be plus... 9 a x squared plus 9 b x plus 9 c plus 9 e x squared e to the 3 x. And supposedly that's equal to the right hand side. 6x squared plus 2 minus 12. If I write too fast, it doesn't write. e to the 3x. All right, now where do we begin? Since this one starts with somewhere, there it is, a constant here, 2a. Let's start with the constants, okay? So on the left-hand side, you got a 2a. That has an x in it. That has an x in it. That has an x in it. That has an x in it, but you have a minus 6b. And that has an x in it. That has an x in it. That has an Come on, where are you? That, has, that one does plus 9c has to equal 2. Okay, because the only one here is 2. So what I'm going to do just for kind of bookkeeping purposes is wipe out that, 
wipe out that, wipe out this, and wipe out that. We've got those covered. Okay, your next term here in your long written out thing here is your x squared e to the 3x term. So here we have 1, a plus 9, and here we have a minus 18, so that makes a minus 9, and here we have another plus 9. And guess what? Those add to 0. So that, that, and that all disappear, which, well, they should because there's no x squared e to the 3x term on the right-hand side. So those are gone. Now let's do our x e to the 3x. Here we have a 12e plus, no, it's x e to the 3x. 12e here minus 12e there and that's all. And those add to 0, which they should because you have no x to the e. 3x term here. So those are taken care of. Now we have for the e to the 3x term we have a 2e here okay I'll wipe that out. Whoa, whoa here comes I think it's Dawson but I can't tell for sure. Move out of the way. Could, could you see the name? I believe it was Dawson. I can't either. There it is. Yep, that's Dawson. Okay. Double the class size. Okay. Dawson, are you still connecting to audio? Still connecting to audio. Still connecting to audio. Evidently, he's having trouble getting connected. Okay, Dawson, what's wrong this morning? Sometimes these systems go so bizarrely. I know yesterday in one of my classes, I had a little blurb come up that the internet was weak signal. So I had to stop talking and the student said I did cut out. Well, actually, I kept talking, but no new material. I just said, hey, I've got, the sign, you know, this uh, warning up here, so I'm going to just keep talking so you can tell me if I'm breaking up or not. So they said I did break up, but it disappeared. And within five minutes, Zoom shut down. Okay. The problem was I had a good internet signal the whole time, uh, at least as indicated down here. Uh, I can't seem to get there. See, that signal actually yesterday was all the bars okay so it wasn't just uh, well it is right now uh, but a minute ago it was only four bars this is five bars and Dawson is still having trouble connecting okay maybe we should sing a song or something waiting for him to get in so so far, it doesn't look like any storms in the area. I look out and the little bit of sky I see is perfectly, beautifully blue, okay? No cloud in sight. Of course, I don't have a wide range and I have a lot of trees. Not a cloud in sight and we're still waiting for Dawson to connect the audio. Can you see that on your screen? His name and connecting the audio? You can, okay. He's probably fussing with it and could be saying all sorts of bad things to it, trying to get it to start. Well, I'm recording it, so I think I'll just go on. Dawson, I hope you get in here soon, <laughs> but uh, let's continue. Okay. So what we have here, 
Dawson, by the way, I, you can't hear me, so I don't guess it's any point in saying it. So where we were was uh, this term here, 2e here, e to the 3x. Let's go to any other terms that have e to the 3x. I don't see a single one except this one, and that is minus 12. So that must equal, if I can get my pen to show up here, equal minus 12. Well, that would imply that e is equal to negative 6. Okay, maybe we should have started there. So that's taking care of this term and that term. Okay, now let's look again at your x terms. Here's a minus 12a. Okay, that's the only x term I see. Oh, there's one. Plus b, plus 9b. Minus 12ax plus 9bx. And over here, we don't have an x term. So this has to equal 0. Now, it's not like that doesn't give us some information. What that tells us is that 9b is equal to 12a. Now, I'm going to leave that alone for now. I'm not going to solve it. Let's just see what happens. Okay, so we've taken care of that. And finally, we get to the x squared term, the only one left standing. And this is a 9a here on the left-hand side, x squared, is equal to 6 on the right-hand side, 6x squared. So this is suggesting that a is equal to 2 thirds. Okay. And if a is equal to 2 thirds, then 9b is equal to 12 times 2 thirds. Well, 3 will go into 12 4 times. That would be 8. 8, okay. Sorry. Uh, so that would suggest that b is equal to 8 ninths. Now, before I proceed any further, let's make sure we haven't gone astray somewhere. A is equal to 2 thirds, got it. B is equal to 8 ninths, got it. C is equal to... Oh, wait a minute, forgot that one. Okay, I did forget something here. I forgot this big old term here. Okay, so 2 times 2 thirds would be 4 thirds minus 6 times 8 ninths would be, goodness gracious, that would be minus 48 ninths. Pretty ugly number. Okay. Plus 9c that we haven't determined yet is going to be 2. I know my least common denominator is going to be 9, so let's make that 18 ninths. And let's change this 4 thirds to 12 ninths. Is that okay? 12 ninths. Okay. So, 12 ninths minus 48 ninths is a negative 36 ninths. Add that to 18 ninths and you get, is that 54 ninths? I believe it is. And divide by 9, and you get 6 ninths, which C would then be, I'm doing this in my head, so I may be wrong, C is equal to 2 thirds as well. Is that what they got? Excellent, excellent. Then I'm not going to trust the book. I'm going to believe you. All right. So now we've got our determined coefficients, <laughs> okay? What we were calling these before was undetermined coefficients. Now we've determined them. All right, we need to write our final solution down. 
and we don't have any room. So what I'm going to do is get my handy dandy little eraser here, if I can. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> there we go. Now the eraser is not working. Boy, what a pain in the neck. Okay. What happened there? C was equal to two thirds. It erased my three. Now let's see if I can get the eraser to show up. No, I can't. So <laughs> I'm going to try something, and this is an experiment. Let me. Nope. <laughs> I thought maybe if I scratch through all that and then hit undo, it would undo it all, but it won't. So I can't get my eraser to come up. Let me try pressing buttons. Nothing seems to be working. So, what I'm going to have to do is just squeeze it in where I can. So here is our solution. Y is equal to, we didn't have any boundary value, and Dawson's still trying to connect the audio. Uh, so we got our C1s in there. So it's C1 e to the 3x plus C2 x e to the 3x plus the particular solution. Well that was ax squared. The a from down here was 2 thirds so it's plus 2 thirds x squared. The b from down here was 8 ninths plus 8 ninths x. The c from up here was 2 thirds plus 2 thirds. That's just a constant. The e from up here was negative 6. So that would be a minus 6 x squared e to the 3x. All right, goodness gracious. Let's see how they did. y is equal to c1 e to the 3x plus c2 x e to the 3x plus 2 thirds x squared, got it, plus 8 ninths x plus 2 thirds minus 6 x squared e to the 3x, got it. Okay, now I don't know why they said using the multiplication rule. Oh, I see. That's the one they give in the middle of the previous page um, where if you already have, but we had already used it, so I don't know. Um, we had already used the e to the x. We'd already used the x e to the x. If I could get my pen, to, yeah. e to the x here, x e to the x here. So that made this one need to be an x squared e to the x. Okay, that was the multiplication rule. All right, we're ready for example 10, and Dawson is still trying to get connected. So we've been at it for about an hour now, and we still have a while. So I was thinking, let's take a quick break and see if Dawson can get connected. I wonder if he can see the screen. I don't know if he can. Uh, I, I have a feeling he can't hear us, so I'm going to write on the screen. We're taking a break. <laughs> I hope you get your audio work, but I can't write that much. I don't have that much room here. There we go. Uh, do you do you do that easily? I can't get this right. Yeah, why don't you send him a, uh, a chat and say that and 
because I've got so much stuff open now I'm sure I could find it but it would be sort of a pain in the neck so let's just take a quick break and we'll be right back I was going to say, this has lost its mind. Ah, there's Dawson. I see him now. Okay. Welcome in, Dawson. You didn't want to listen to us today, did you? Okay, I saw your microphone go off, but I couldn't hear anything. So maybe your audio is working, but you're on receiving in, but your sending is not working, I don't think. But try it again. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good deal. All right, we just finished example 9 on the top of page 149. We're in chapter 4, higher order differential equations, 4.4 undetermined coefficient superposition approach, and we just did example 9. Uh, we were trying to wait for you, but your audio wasn't cooperating at all, so we went on and finished it. Uh, you can hear it on YouTube video when it comes up which will be a while. It takes a couple of hours for it to load and that'll put me in the middle of my next class and then it'll be a while before I get it but sometime this afternoon hopefully I'll have it out there. Alright, any questions, issues, concerns before we get going again? I take that to be a no. Alright, so let's move on to example 10. Okay. Um, let me clear my screen. Okay, here's example 10. Let me get my Wacom down here. Y triple prime, first one we've had of that in a while. Y triple prime plus Y double prime. is equal to e to the x cosine x. Okay. A simple enough looking issue, but I have a feeling it promises to have all sorts of quirks in it. So let's see if we can discover the quirks. Okay. Again, a linear a uh, higher order differential equation with constant coefficients. So we use our assumption let y equal e to the mx. Okay. With that in mind then when you plug that in you're going to get your auxiliary equation to be m cubed plus m squared and we're going to assume the, the right hand side is zero so we can make this equal zero. What does that produce? What would you do with a problem like that? This is an algebra problem. It's not a calculus problem. It's not a differential equation problem. Just algebra. What would you do? Billy, don't be offended by this. I think Dawson knows it. What's the F word? factor. Factor out all you can. That's a m squared times m plus 1. And that's equal to 0. Well, what does that give you for roots? m equals 0, which is a double root, and m equal negative 1, a single root. Okay, so what does that give you? Okay, remember what our original assumption was. Y is equal to E to the MX. Okay, now, uh, E to the 0X would be 1. So, what we have is our characteristic solution, y sub c, 
would equal um, C1. That's it. But this is a double root here. So the next one would be a C2x. Okay. And then this one would be a plus C3 e to the minus x. Now let's see if that's what they got. Okay. C1 plus C2x plus C3 e to the minus x. Yes, there's your characteristic solution. Now let's start fiddling with our particular solution. We'll go up to the top here and your y sub p, Dawson just left, okay, he must be having connection problems again. Your particular solution would be Aries back, okay. Uh, your particular solution normally, now this is a product, and if you go to that table a couple pages across, you know, before, you'll see e to the x is basically going to be an ae to the x. Don't worry about that. Get the one that's more complicated. Cosine x would have to be a, a cosine x plus b sine x. And then <clears throat> incorporate uh, the e into that. The table I'm talking about is on page 146. This would be a case similar to number... Ten. Okay. Uh, so a e to the x. Okay. Plus b. Oh, a, cosine x. So here's what we have. The a e to the x. Okay. Um, I wrote in the wrong place. My pen's still not writing. So this is a e to the x here. Actually, let me try this. Let's see what happens. One more. Okay. That does come in handy sometime. a e to the x cosine x plus B e to the x sine x. Okay. Now, neither one of these conflicts with anything down here. This is a product, so you've got e to the x times all your possibilities for the cosine, which are sine and cosine, and so your e to the x is going to show up in both of those. So we now have to start taking a bunch of derivatives. The y sub p prime. Good practice for Cal 1, wasn't it? Okay, I'll write down the a. And here comes Corbin. Good deal. If I can get my pen to admit them in. All right, Corbin's here. Welcome, Corbin. Okay, just to let you know where we are, I can't tell if his audio is hooked up or not, but just to let him know where we are, we're in Chapter 4, Higher Order Differential Equations. We're in 4.4, .4, Undetermined Coefficients Using the Superposition Approach. Okay, we're on example 10 on page 149. That's near the bottom of page 149, lower half of 149. We've started working on that. But also, both for your purpose and for Dawson, since he came in and now has audio, let me hit just a couple of other things. I've already put your test 3 out there in Blackboard messages. Okay? Stop me five minutes before the class is over. That's at uh, 10, 1045. So stop me at least 1040 or maybe a little earlier. And we'll go over what's expected on the test. Okay. Um, 
but let me go on and get this set. I've already said it to Billy. Sorry, Billy, you have to hear it again. But um, please, if you haven't gotten me, and several of you have, your research papers, please get me the research paper as soon as you can, okay, as soon as possible. Some of you may not have turned in test one yet. I think the three I'm talking to now have, but in case you have it, but it may be the ones I'm not talking, uh, ones that are listening to YouTube video, hopefully. Please get your first test in. Please get your second test in. I need those, all three of those in just as soon as possible. Your research paper, your first test, and your second test. I need those soon because you need to be working on test three because that's due uh, grades are due in, the last I saw, and I don't think they've changed it, uh, by noon on Monday, which means you have this afternoon, you have tomorrow, you have Saturday, but please don't take too much of Sunday. I need those in. The sooner the better. If you could get them to me this afternoon, I'm delighted. Okay, Tomorrow, that's okay too. Saturday's fine. But Sunday, please don't get them to me at 10 o'clock at night. I won't even get it printed until the next morning. And I may not even see it because I may be busy trying to get grades done and stuff like this. I may not even see it until after the deadline. So please get me as much as you can as soon as you can. All right. We'll talk about the test itself the last five minutes. But that's everything up until this third test. And by the way, your research paper is not a... A droppable score and the last test the one we're doing now the one I give you today I've already put it out there that's not droppable I can drop your lower of the other two scores if that helps your average okay that's just bookkeeping okay so let's go back and do the first derivative of your your particular solution here okay well there's a product rule so it's the first e to the x times the derivative of cosine x. Well, that's going to be a minus sine x. Okay, plus the second times the derivative of the first. Well, that's going to be an a e to the x. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x cosine x. Okay, so we've done the product rule here. Let's do the product rule here. This is plus b e to the x, the first times the derivative of the second, cosine x, plus b derivative of the first times the second, e to the x, sine x. All right, now, because you have different A's and B's here, nothing comes out. No combining like terms. You could group things together. Obvious, E to X could be factored out of everything, but we'll hang off of that for a moment. <clears throat> so let's move on to Y, P, double prime. Okay, now minus a e to the x times the derivative of that is cosine x. Minus a e to the x sine x. Okay. That's the first one, product rule. Second one, a minus a e to the x sine x okay and a plus a e to the x cosine x. All right, that's those terms. Now let's do these terms. Minus a b e to the x sine x. Plus 
plus b e to the x cosine x. Second one plus b e to the x cosine x plus b e to the x sine x. Now let's see if we lose anything here. Oh, we do, don't we? We have a minus a e to the x cosine x and a plus a e to the x cosine x. Down here we have a minus b e to the x sine x and a plus b e to the x sine x. Okay, we wind up with minus two of these and plus two of those. So let's somehow write that in here. Uh, if I can get this. So minus two here and we'll wipe out that one. And plus two here and we'll wipe out that one. That simplified some. So that should help us do y sub p triple prime. Okay. Whew. All right. This will be a minus 2a e to the x cosine x minus 2a e to the x sine x. Plus, so let's make it the first one a minus, minus 2b e to the x sine x plus 2b e to the x cosine x. Wow. All right. I think that's our y triple prime. Now, what we have to do next is put at least two of those together, the triple prime and the prime, and see what comes out. So I'm going to come over here to the far left, if I can get it to the right, and that will be a minus. Now, let's factor out the e to the x. Why not? e to the x. So I don't have to keep writing those things. Times a minus 2 cosine x I've left off the a to a cosine x minus 2 a sine x minus 2 b sine x plus 2b cosine x. Now, all those y double primes also have an e to the x in them, so we'll keep that factored out, keep this in the parentheses, and this gives a minus 2a sine x and a plus 2b cosine x. Sorry, it's writing all over the page here. I hope I've got that right. Okay. Close the parentheses. Okay. That's the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is going to be e x cosine x e to the x cosine x all right if it's okay with you i'm just going to go away with the e to the x is right now you see there's one on each side so let's just forget about those for a moment and get everything else to balance okay here we have a minus two 
2a, my phone keeps ringing it, aggravating, a minus 2a cosine x here, and that's the only one I see there. Uh, so it looks like that minus 2a plus 2b, I'm doing all the terms with cosine in them, okay, plus another 2b, so that's 4b, 2b plus 2b cosine x, that must equal 1, because there's your cosine x over there. Now, your sine x terms are minus 2a, that one, oops, minus 4a, because we have 2a from here and a minus 2a from there, and then a minus 2b from here, that has to equal 0. Okay, now if you remember solving two equations, two unknowns, uh, one way to do it is double that second equation, where's the pen here, and make this a minus 8a minus 4b is equal to 0. Then add these two equations together and you get 10a minus 10a is equal to 1 and that gives you a is equal to minus 1 tenth. Oh my goodness, I think we got it right. Yep. Now, let's figure out what B is. Let's go back to this equation I wiped out here. And actually what I want to do is divide everything by 2. And that would give us, uh, I'll write it up here because I can't erase anymore, minus 2A minus B is equal to 0. And A is minus 1 tenth. So that would be 1 fifth, 2 tenths is 1 fifth, minus B is equal to 0, which would imply that B is equal to 1 fifth. Well, let's see if they got that right. Yes, they did. Good for them. Now, the only issue is, where do I write my solution? And this was not an initial value problem, and my eraser isn't working anymore. I don't think. I can't get it to work. Let me try something else. It seems like I tried something and got it to work before. Let me do a select here. Well, that's not working either. Text is not working. Draw is working. Okay, I don't know. I can't get it to work, so let's not worry about it. Somewhere I've got to write my solution. I think I'll do it here. It's not much room, but a little bit of room. Y is equal to, we don't have these yet, so let's just write those down. C1 plus C2x plus C3 e to the x. That's your characteristic solution. Plus, or actually it's going to be a minus one tenth, because that's what the a was, e to the x cosine x plus one-fifth 
e to the x sine x. Done. Okay, let's see how the book did. y is equal to c1 plus c2x plus c3e to the, that is a minus x. I didn't, if I tried to write it, it didn't show up. So let me, yuck. I can't get the, okay, there, it finally wrote. I think that's what happened before. C3e to the minus x minus one tenth e to the cosine e to the x cosine x plus one fifth e to the x sine x. Whew. All right, there's example ten. Any questions on that? Shows a lot of the techniques that we were talking about. So, any questions? All right, to clear. Okay. That's clear. Let's move on to example 11. The last example in the section. Let's see what we can do. I think I'll have to get my book in my lap to be able to read it well. Okay. Here is a fourth order differential equation. I'm not sure we've had one of these before, but let's do it. Remember, we don't do primes up to 3, so we do the order in parentheses as, as a superscript. That isn't an exponent. So the fourth derivative of y plus the third derivative of y, that one we can put 3, that's the left-hand side, and that's equal to 1 minus x squared e to the minus x. All right. Promises to hold some potential issues with our particular solution, but we'll just wait till we get there. All right. Now, quick review. I think everybody's here I don't see Billy anymore I hope she's still here um, but anyway the can't get my pen to work here it is you're an, for the left hand side when you set the right hand side equal to zero for the homogeneous case we have e y is equal to e to the mx which when you do your auxiliary solution that would be m to the fourth plus m cubed, homogeneous case, equals zero. Now, it's very similar to something we had before, but one degree greater. Okay, so our solutions here are factor out the m cubed times m plus one equals zero. Okay, now the m this would be a triple root for m equals 0. Multiplicity of 3. And an m is equal to minus 1. This is the very last example we did. Very similar. And very similar to that, here's what our characteristic solution would be. y sub c. When m is equal to 0, e to the 0x is a constant, is 1. So that would just be C1, but we have multiplicity of 3, so you would need a C2x plus a C3x squared. You just multiply an x for every multiplicity until you reach 3 multiplicity, 3 constants. And then the next one would be plus c4 e to the minus x. That's your simple plug it in e to the minus x. All right. Let's move up to your particular solution. The y sub p here. Okay, first you have a constant. So that's just going to be 
an A. That's all you need for the one is an A. Plus, now we have a product. Okay? And the product is, normally you just say B squared E, well, okay, let's take that back one. You have a polynomial multiplied by an exponential. The exponential just needs a coefficient. The polynomial is going to supply that, okay? But the polynomial is a squared, so basically what you have here is a B x squared but you have to account for every term in that polynomial plus and by the way this also has an e to the my yuck I don't think my erasers come back has it no it has it that has an e to the minus x in it because it's a product okay that is a minus there plus cx e to the minus x plus they don't like to use d so I'm trying to write an e x squared no I'm sorry e I already got my x squared e e to the minus x okay you have to have every term in the polynomial uh, quadratic term, a linear term, and a constant term. And they're all multiplied by e to the minus x. Except we have a problem, don't we, Houston? We already have a, number one, we have a constant down here. C1, we have a constant here. You can't, okay? But you would normally multiply that by x. You can't. They've already got an x here. So you'd multiply it by x squared. You can't because they already have an x squared one. So you have to multiply this times x cubed. So it doesn't interfere with your characteristic solution. Now, <laughs> the bx squared e to the minus x, that's no problem. cx e to the minus x, that's no problem. Except this e, e to the minus x is a problem. So you need to put an x in here. Okay, but you already have that, so you have to make that an x squared, okay, and you have to make this an x cubed, okay. So while they were problems, okay, um, <laughs> so I've got to sneeze, I'm sorry. Okay, I think I'm over it. All right, there is my guess of your particular solution. Let's see what they did. Okay. Yes, your particular solution had to jump up to ax cubed plus bx cubed e to the minus x plus cx squared e to the minus x plus ex e to the minus x. That's what that mess there looks like. Well, guess what? All they asked for is to determine the form of the particular solution. They did not ask you to solve this thing. And I'm about to say thank you very much. Because what we would have to do is take a first derivative of all that, which would be, this, wouldn't, this one wouldn't be bad. This one would be a product rule. Okay, fine. That would be a product rule, fine. And that would be a product rule, fine, okay? Then you would have to have your second derivative. That would have a second derivative, no problem there. This would be another product rule of two product rules, and that would be another product rule of two product rules, and that would be another product rule of two. So they're growing like crazy. That's only second derivative. Third derivative, they expand and expand and expand. That would take us the rest of the period just to work that out. They didn't ask us to, let's not. We got a, oh, Corbin. I guess he had to leave, but he's come back. So I'm guessing he got booted out, but uh, glad you're back. Now, let's see about the remarks here. I don't see anything real special here to mention if you want to look at them, 
by all means look at them okay so let's just go and in fact I guess I ought to get back to my book slide here and there it is and I guess we didn't even do the last one properly okay no I guess we did I'll scoot this on up there's okay first there was our solution for the number nine and here was what they asked on number 10 uh, yeah I didn't come back and do this there's our problem on number 10 there's everything we ran into on number 10 and there's the solution we got okay then number 11 we just were working on there was the problem and you have to come up with the particular solution even though they said determine the form of the particular solution you have to do the characteristic solution in order to see if you have any duplication and certainly we did in both cases so your uh, what you would have normally guessed would be a good thing for YP1 doesn't work because you have a constant in the particular uh, characteristic solution um, what worked here would normally have worked well for YP2 doesn't work well because that just duplicates that one so you have to put not just one X in here because you already had that not just two X's in here because you already had that you have to have X cubed and that's how that became an X cubed now once you see this conflicts with that, you would normally put an X in here, okay? And you would. But that then duplicates this one, so you have to put X squared for that one. Now that duplicates this one, so you have to put an X cubed for that one. So you have to multiply everything by X within a given thing just to keep from having any uh, complications. And we did that and we got it so the remarks like I said I don't see anything super uh, they're talking about the problems coming up you can look at those see what you get um, they talk more about that form rule for case one um, so I'll leave that with you there so homework exercises not that you'll be if they help you when you're doing your test, do them because these answers are in the back of the book. So do any of the odds 1 through 25, okay, that you need to do to help you do your final exam, okay? Any of the odds 1 through 25. I can't show them all on the same screen. They go down to there, okay? Then do any of the odds 27 to 35. I think I can show all those. Okay, and then 37 or 39. There those are. Now those are boundary value problems. They didn't show us any with boundary value problems, but remember boundary value problems you won't always be able to eliminate all your uh, arbitrary coefficients. Okay, just remember that. Okay, 41. You can, should be able to do that. That answer's in the back. It has a piecewise defined function, which is sort of interesting. Uh, I'll let you figure, play around with that. You won't have anything like that on the test, I'll tell you that much. Okay, after that are discussion problems. If you find any of those with answers in the back, feel free to, to do any of those. Most of the time they're not, so that pretty much wraps up uh, 4.4 okay now if you recall 4.5 is an alternative thing to do rather than 4.4 we did 4.4 we don't do 4.5 it just gives you another approach to how to find the undetermined coefficients okay not that much difference but it is some okay but don't worry about them. We already know the technique. Use superposition. If you don't like it and you want to go and study the annihilator approach, you can do that. You'll get the same coefficients.
okay so we're not doing 4.5 we're going to 4.6 so let's go there okay now why did it go to the problems in 4.6 I don't know oh no I'm sorry I needed to go on further down the page that's why there it is 4.6 is variation of parameters okay now what in the world do we mean by that well basically 4.4 .4 and 5 we did 4.4 .4, the method for undetermined coefficients has two inherent weaknesses that limit its wider application to linear equations first the differential equation must have constant coefficients and the input function g must be of the type listed in that table we talked about those were polynomial functions exponential functions sine and cosine functions that's all folks okay combinations of those for sure okay but no logs no tangents no secants no inverse tangents inverse signs you know none of that okay and all your coefficients had to be constant in this section we'll examine a method for determining a particular solution y sub p of a non-homogeneous linear yeah a non-homogeneous linear equation that has in theory no such restrictions that method due to the uh, eminent astronomer and mathematician Joseph Joseph Louis Lagrange now that sounds like a fairly French name I don't recall right now whether he was it seems like he was one that I don't say here uh, but anyway he came up with uh, this I, I'm, I'm guessing it was French um, and if he was I'm sort of sorry for him because as you see here the years of his life um, he only lived to be well he lived to be 77 which is a very good ripe old age at that time especially if he was French that meant he endured the French Revolution uh, in fact I'm almost wondering if it was still hanging in there in 1813 I wonder if that's why he died at that age because that was a bloody mess okay uh, and many of the French intellectuals got caught in the crossfires or, or chopping block or whatever okay so anyway uh, he's responsible for this so let's scroll on down here um, there I couldn't find my cursor okay um, before examining this powerful method for higher order equations let's revisit linear first order differential equations don't think we're going to get too far here because we only have less than half an hour about about 15 minutes before I have to stop and talk about it so anyway um, let's go back and look at our linear first order differential equations okay way back 2.3 we saw that the general solution for a linear first order differential equation remember a sub 1 of x the coefficient is not necessarily a, a constant it can be a function of x times y prime plus a sub 0 of x y is equal to something on the right hand side g of x okay there were no limitations at that time what the g of x were okay now what you did you divided everything because the a1 of x okay here's one a requirement that could not be zero for any value x in the interval for which this uh, uh, differential equation was defined it could not be zero anywhere there and if it couldn't be zero that means we could divide by it so if you divide all three things here by a one of x then you get um, y prime by itself dy dx and this now will be a zero of x divided by a one of x which is just some function of x which we rename p of x remember and then the g of x divided by a one of x is just some other function of x 
we called f of x. And again, no real restrictions on the f or the p. Okay. Here's the only restriction. Assume that p of x and f of x are continuous on that common interval i for which this function is defined, this differential equation is defined. Now, remember we did the integrating factor here. First thing we did was integrate p of x dx right there. Okay, then we did e to the minus of that. Well, I'm sorry, e to that, that became your um, integrating factor and we proceeded and not going to go through the whole thing here but then your final solution was um, y is equal to c1 e to the minus integral of p of x dx plus c2 now this was a 4 in the example in section 2.3 this is a little bit further down the road than just a simple one and you had this factor again integrating that without the minus sign in it f of x dx okay now that solution that you see here is the same form that given in theorem 4.1.6 mainly that y is equal to yc plus yp now here is your yc, first order, one arbitrary coefficient, and this is your yp, no arbitrary coefficient. Okay. Now, in that case, the yc would be your solution, or this yc would be solution when you put a zero here rather than an f of x. Okay. And then your particular solution would be this thing. Okay? I know it's going out on you. Let me scroll on down so you can see it better. That would then be your particular solution. Okay. Of uh, the non homogeneous equation, that, that f of x is over there. As a means of motivating a method for solving non homogeneous linear equations of higher order we propose to derive a particular solution to this thing by a method known as variation of parameters that's what the section is named okay and like I said we're probably not going to get very far on this but at least hopefully if you ever need it you'll have a little bit of context to go back and use uh, study it suppose that y1 is a known solution for the homogeneous uh, equation this one that's your uh, you know it works for for this one okay um, that is dy1 dx plus p of x y1 is equal to zero it says it's easily shown that y is equal to e to the minus okay sorry let me go back up here there it is, right there. E to the minus integral of p of x dx. That's going to be a solution to this thing. We already have said that, okay? So why reinvent the wheel, okay? And let me scroll up again because that box is in the way. Okay. So there is a solution. And because the equation is linear, uh, C1 times that Y1 is its general solution. That's what we were calling the, the characteristic solution. Variation, variation of parameters consists of finding a particular solution of that first one of the form uh, Y sub P, and you've seen this technique you've used before, is some u of x times that y1 of x that you know works here. In other words, we've replaced the parameter c1 with a function u1, and now it's a function of x. So substituting now the y sub p to be u1 y1 into your original equation, 
using the product rule, this technique we've done about two or three times now, that would be the derivative of that thing would be u1 y1 prime plus y1 u1 prime plus the p of x u1 y1 equal f of x. Okay, now notice what is wrong here. I'm trying to get it to scroll down and it's not. Okay. Okay. Don't let me run over because I want to go over your test with you. Um, now, the things that we have done before, we're going to do something very similar here. Okay. Let's take all the terms with the U1 in it. That's this term and that term. And factor it out. So it's U1 times dy1 x plus p of x y1 so that's that one plus and then what you have left is y1 times d sub u, d of u of 1 dx and that's equal to f of x all right now this right here remember that was our characteristic solution that zero so now you have a solution a an equation that looks like this y1 times d1 d u1 of x d d u1 dx okay i can't get it out y1 times that is f of x okay now this one is separable because remember the assumption here is that the y's are all here and this is all u x's here. So if we do the put the dx over here and divide by du well no I'm sorry that's not right. Uh, the, the y is a function of x. So put it divide by y of x y one of x and the dx over here and then you have your du over here integrate that and you have u1 is equal to the integral of f of x over y1 of x okay that's basically the same thing we went through to get that equation we did talked about earlier so here the salt after particular solution would be that integral u1 times your y1 okay and from the fact that y1 is equal to this thing you see the result is exactly equal to 3 so why did we go back and do all that I'm not sure okay uh, they could have <laughs> they could have just left it like this and say that's it <laughs> you know, that's all folks that's your particular solution but they took you through and did the same thing over again I guess just to show you get the same thing again I'm, I'm not really sure it seems like it was a waste of time and space here all right so let's look at a linear second order differential equation okay this time it's not constant coefficients a2 of x y double prime plus a1 of x y prime plus a0 of x y prime y is equal to some g of x and there's no restriction so far on that g of x either although as we can see variation of parameters extends to as we shall see not can see shall see extends to higher order uh, equations and the method again begins by putting y into a little bit more of a standard form this time we divide and again the reason we can do this is a2 of x can never be zero in the interval on which you're dealing with because if it was it's no longer a second order differential equation it's a first order at best okay so we can divide by the a2 of x and that gives you y double prime 
and then the p of x is now a1 divided by a2 your q of x is now a0 divided by a2 and your f of x is g of x divided by a2 okay those are all functions of x alone still they may be rational functions or all sorts of weird things but they're they're okay so in this we suppose that the coefficient functions p of x q of x f of x again we're going to have to assume they're continuous on some common interval i um, certainly will include the interval that a2 of x could not be zero in okay remember that because that's how we got them okay as we've already seen from section 4.3 which is back when we we're doing the uh, characteristic solution there's no difficulty in obtaining the complementary solution okay uh, I, you know that's that's being a little flippant here because when we were doing this remember we had constant coefficients. These, even though that's a constant, these two are not. Okay, but they're saying there's no difficulty in obtaining that complementary solution, and that's usually the case. The general solution of the associated uh, homogeneous uh, associated homogeneous equation, when the coefficients are co oh, I see, I didn't read the whole sentence. There's no problem when they are constants. But analogous to the preceding discussion, we now ask, then can those parameters C1 and C2 and Y sub C now be replaced just like we did before with functions, U1 of X and U2 of X. Before we only needed U1, now we need two of them. So I wonder if that can happen. So those are what we call your variable parameters hence the name variation of parameters okay would this then be a particular solution uh, of six okay and you go back and do a lot of the same things we did before you take the first derivative of this using the product rules the second derivative using the product rule plug back into this and when you do all that and group them appropriately you'll see this part here is exactly your what you had started off being your homogeneous form and so that's zero this one turns out to be the homogeneous form for the uh, y prime 2 okay so you get rid of both of those and now you're down to y double prime your particular solution is y1 u double prime plus y1 prime u prime okay it does get a lot messier but you have a lot more terms here and they have skipped so many steps i can't possibly go back and do those steps for you not in the time we have left so this is where we're going to have to call it quits so as I was fearing, I don't think we got far enough along for you to do any variation parameters on the test. I put a few questions out there just in case we get to get further. We didn't. So let's pause now and go and look at your test. I didn't intend this, but it pulled it, pulled it up somewhere here. I saw it. There it is right there. Here is your test. Okay. I think I'll move you guys over here to the side. I can't tell. Have we lost Billy? Looks like we have. Okay. So here's your test. I think it says test three, which is correct. Okay. To begin with, Determine whether the following functions are linearly independent or dependent on the given intervals. Here is the first function. Here is the second function. Are those linearly independent or dependent on this interval here? 
0 to positive infinity. Same thing here. First function, second function. And now you have some other things you put there. The whole real number line, independent or dependent. These two functions, okay? That's what you have to do just determine linearly linear independence or dependence for those pairs of functions. Now, down here, we get three functions. It's not just two. F1, F2, and F3 over that. F1, F2, and F3 over that same interval. Okay? So, you determine that. Your answers here are just going to be the words independent or dependent. Okay? That'll do it. Now, down here, this is closer to what we were doing toward the end here. Consider this differential equation here, second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients and with a uh, non-homogeneous. A, B, and C are constants, no functions, okay? And it says choose the input function g of s, g of x, for which the method of uh, undetermined coefficients is applicable and, wait a minute, that this statement doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. Now, you don't have to choose the input function. I've given you the input function. You choose whether that input function is applicable in uh, for undetermined coefficients. You don't have to do the variation of parameters. We didn't get far enough along. You don't have to do this one. If you already know it or you want to uh, look at it and, and make some educated guesses, they will be bonus, okay? These you have to do. In other words, are these legitimate g of x's for undetermined coefficients? And later, you would have said, are they for a variation of parameters, okay? That's what it is. The, the, the thing here, um, choose whether, that's what it's trying to say, whether this function g of x can be solved using undetermined coefficients, yes or no. Okay, so those are your number two. Then three, four, and five, I think that's all, is solve, this is a homogeneous, homogeneous, non-homogeneous. Notice none of these are, are initial value problems, so you will have either two, or three arbitrary coefficients in your solutions for these. Okay. Any question? This one will have uh, just those solutions. This one will have a particular solution as well. Okay. Any questions? All right. Now, I think since Corbin came in, let me go on and say this. If, I think maybe I already said it, but this is for other people. If that's all they're listening to is this part here. Please, if you have not turned in your research paper, get that to me as soon as is humanly possible for you to do so. Okay? As soon as possible. If you haven't gotten the first or second test into me, please get those into me just as soon as you possibly can. Okay? And then this test. I need it as soon as you can get it to me. If you can get it to me this afternoon, I'll be delighted. Tomorrow would be fine. Saturday will be fine. If you're going to still be working on it through Sunday, please get it to me. I think as I've been saying, by midday or no later than mid-afternoon. If I get it at 10 o'clock at night, I probably won't even see it. I will be done for the day. I probably won't even see it to print it. I come in Monday morning and I find it somewhere there. Uh, I'm probably not going to have time to grade and get everything done because grades are due in by noon on Monday. 
so I want to have all my grading finished by Sunday night. So that's why I say please get it to me by noon or mid-afternoon on Sunday. If everyone gives it to me mid-afternoon on Sunday, I'm going to have a long night. So I'm hoping everybody gets that most people get it to me sooner uh, than that. So, but if it comes in to me um, late Sunday, I'm, the, there's a real good chance I won't even see the thing until I've turned in the grades, probably given you an incomplete, and then I go back and start, I usually go back and start sending emails to people I've given incomplete explaining. If I then find you've sent it in since I, the last time I looked, then I'll get it, print it, grade it, and change the incomplete to a, a letter grade. But it will be an incomplete to begin with. Okay, so please get me everything you can as soon as you can. One other issue, and I wish I had said this while Billy was still here, they have, I mean, just this week, opened the student course evaluations. Check your Lawson State email, and you'll find that something from the dean. It has a link in it. Click on the link. It takes you right there. Really easy process to get those done. Please do them, okay? Please do the student course evaluation. I'll probably copy that email uh, and put it on Blackboard, but I'm not even sure people will be checking Blackboard, so give it a shot. Please do the student course evaluation. Any questions at all? Okay. I've enjoyed having y'all in class. Y'all have been a good class. Uh, we've gotten just about as far as we've gotten in any of my differential equation classes, except for the fact we lost a week and a half. This should be a 10-week term. It turned out to be an eight and a half week term. So sorry about that, uh, but uh, please get your uh, stuff into me as soon as you can. Sorry you didn't get as much as you paid for, but I tried my best. So anyway, take care and get me the stuff as you can. If you have any questions, email me, send me a message on Blackboard. I'll be checking those periodically. If there are no questions, I'm going to stop the sharing, okay? Corbin, I see your microphone's on. Did you have a question? Okay. All right. Well, then I'll end the meeting. So I've enjoyed ha having you and seeing you. We'll, huh, you won't see me next summer. I'll be retired by then. So take care, folks. Bye-bye.